Okay. I hope everybody can hear me very well. Um, if not, uh, drop a message on the, the chat box, please. Um, you should also see me, so sorry for that. <laughs> so uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, I think it's the first time we're hosting it from EMEA. And I wish to thank my colleague, Jane, who is in the UK, for helping me out with this. Um, myself, I'm Philip. I'm a techie guy at Tagira. Um, so, okay. So I'm a solution architect, so it means I'm um, basically doing the techie stuff, as I mentioned before. My background is merely security. Uh, most of my time I spent at F5 Networks doing load balancing and web application security. I moved on to virtual load balancing and security. I also run a, a security event. Perhaps people from EMEA know it, Brucon, hosted in Belgium. Sadly, canceled the corona this year, um, but it's mainly uh, security related and hacking. Um, I found a second life in containers and Kubernetes. That's what I started doing about four or five years ago and tried to combine it uh, with some hacking techniques from the past. If you want to check me out, go to LinkedIn or you can follow me at Twitter. Um, I tend to post some hacking tutorials uh, quite often. Enough about me. Um, feel free to reach out or to Jane and we'll gladly assist you or help you or provide you any information um, you want. So this workshop is hosted by Calico and Tagira. Tagira is the company behind Calico and Project Calico. Doesn't mean that Tagira is making Project Calico. Project Calico is a community based project that essentially created an open source networking and networking security uh, solution for containers, which is probably most known. It can also control access to and from virtual machines and even host-based networks. So it's not only containers, although this is the focus of today. So um, I'm starting from the point that we already have a Kubernetes cluster with Calico, but it should actually work on any type of Kubernetes environment uh, for the remainder of the day. So check out the project, uh, feel free. Um, I invite you, if you have questions or discussions, join the Slack channel. There's a lot of help um, and we're pretty responsive and monitoring these channels together with the community. Uh, day in and day out. Make sure you get these things, a lot of information. I'm going to use our time valuable and go to Ingress. So let's dive in some YAML. Um, everybody who loves Kubernetes loves YAML. And let me start basically from the beginning. When we talk about Ingress, we typically think about load balancing services, externally reachable services inside the Kubernetes cluster but it's really not as easy as that sounds. So let's start from the beginning. Um, and the beginning is typically that we deploy a small application. I call this application um, my Nginx deployment. It basically launches containers based on the Nginx uh, container image and it exposes port 80, as you can see. Um, please note that in the template, we actually add a label. So every pot inside of this deployment will have a label called app Nginx. And our replica set controllers will make sure that we have about three of these replicas running uh, at any time. If you know some basic things about Kubernetes, you will know that these pots are typically spun up somewhere inside the Kubernetes cluster. They will get an IP from the underlying CNI which in our case would be Calico. So that means that very often these spots have an IP address, which is only reachable inside of the cluster. Um, on purposely, I mentioned the replicas. So that means that we can add or remove replicas. Uh, pots may crash or die, new will spin up. 
So the very nature of these IP addresses of these spots is very, very, very dynamic. To be honest, um, in a normal scenario, you cannot rely on the IP address because it might change uh, every two, three minutes. So how can we actually reach these spots? Well, that's why we introduced uh, in Kubernetes, I'm not Calico, uh, there was cluster IP, which is basically a Kubernetes resource that basically captures all the pods with the selector here up Nginx and make sure it is exposed on port 80. The name of that service is in this case, my Nginx cluster IP. And it basically means that if somebody would connect to this cluster IP and the cluster IP is an IP address, which is essentially taken from the service side, uh, which is a configuration inside of uh, Kubernetes or in the Calico configuration that basically says, okay, if somebody connects to, in this case, my Nginx cluster IP, it's also resolvable by DNS, by the way, um, as you will see in the demo. IP tables or IPVS will make sure that connections targeting that cluster IP will be somehow load balanced or shared across uh, the pods inside of um, that deployment or namespace. Services are namespace bound. That means that you can have multiple services called my Nginx cluster IP, uh, but in different namespaces. So the entire idea of a service is to basically abstract the IP address of the pod and make sure that we can always reach a pod uh, which is behind the service. Uh, this is the concept in service. We talk about endpoints. So a service has a list of all the available endpoints inside of the cluster. So still this cluster IP is reachable within the cluster, but quite often, although with Calico, uh, you can uh, avoid that. But in general, the cluster IP is not reachable outside of the cluster. That's why we need to introduce a concept which is called node port. A node port is essentially the same service, but of type north port. And what it will do, it will basically expose this service on the node, so every node in the cluster of Kubernetes, on typically a port somewhere in the range of 30,000 something. Um, it essentially means that if we have three or four or five nodes inside of a Kubernetes cluster, Every node in this case will expose port 30,000 minus 70 and make sure that these spots are reachable from outside. Now, as you can see, the downside is a little bit, these numbers are in a higher range. And if I would create another service, it'd probably be another port number. So the problem is how do I reach this and how do I know this? It's not that easy to solve. And two, yeah, as I explained, it's hosted on every node. How does my incoming connections basically get to the right node or an available node? Um, so the next try to solve that was the introduction of the load balancing uh, resource. Again, a load balancing resource is exactly the same service, but of type load balancing. And when you create a service of type load balancing, what it will actually do is spin up a load balancer and make sure that this load balancer, which is typically residing outside of the, <coughs> sorry, outside of the cluster, although it doesn't have to be, um, and make sure that port 80 or 443 is available from outside and being load balanced to uh, the node port. So from external, from the internet, side of things in, in this case, we could actually reach the load balance on port 80 or 443. We'll get redirected to one of the nodes on port 30,970 and the service concepts so or IP tables will make sure that we reach one or the other pod. Please note that this idea and concept of a load balancer is not something which is part of Kubernetes. There is a definition, so there is a resource of type load balancer, but it typically requires that your cloud or your Kubernetes is configured with a cloud provider so that it can essentially 
config an external load balancer, whether it is an Amazon uh, or an Azure, or perhaps an F5 device, which is outside of the cluster and so on and so forth. So it requires some form of integration. Very often, if you use your own Kubernetes cluster, which you built yourself, this integration is not there. But if you use Amazon or you use Azure or something like this, a managed cloud, um, this is typically done already for you, and you can start using that um, right off. So what did I do here? Uh, these are the examples I will be using uh, later on in the demo. But essentially, in the first part, I just created an application. As you can see, it all assigned an IP address uh, coming from a Calico IP pool. So they're dynamic. Um, I created some examples. So you see there's a cluster IP, which is typically only reachable within the cluster. Um, a node port, you can see that it is assigned a higher port. And when I created the load balancers, you can actually see that it gets external IP addresses. Please know that one is in pending state. So once you create a load balancer, it will actually instruct the cloud to spin up a load balancer. And these can be of any different form. Um, so it takes a while before the address is assigned. And also please note that if you create multiple load balancing services, they are assigned typically different IP addresses, which also means in some clouds that in this case, um, we will be having two load balancers. So you will be charged for two load balancers, which kind of makes it um, expensive. Quite often, these load balancers are simply layer four load balancers, so they do not really do something intelligent. You might opt for application layer type load balancers like in Azure or in Amazon or in Google, um, and then you can actually configure more advanced uh, parameters through the means of annotations, but this is a little bit out of scope for this training. So knowing that we can expose services externally through load balancing services, it's layer four and basically it might be quite expensive or using uh, too much IP addresses as we uh, made one to. So that's why, and for quite some other reasons also, uh, to be clear, we can introduce Kubernetes ingress. So Kubernetes ingress um, or an ingress controller is typically a load balancer that is installed inside of your Kubernetes cluster, although it doesn't have to. For example, just Google um, ingress for Amazon or Azure or Google, and you will see that they can use external load balancers. Um, you can actually use any type of proxy um, if you want to, or sometimes called edge routers or ingress routers, depending on who you Google. The main idea, and perhaps a little bit the simpleness of an ingress controller is that it only exposes HTTP and HTTPS, so not layer four. If you need to expose layer four, uh, services like DNS, for example, or whatever else, um, you might have to reside back to the things we discussed earlier. So thanks to this ingress controller, uh, we can actually expose HTTP and HTTPS. And a key concept here is that it is layer seven aware. That means that an ingress controller can actually take action based on URLs, host names. It can actually do more advanced load balancing because it's layer seven aware, meaning that it can actually take something in account like slash app one goes to this service, slash app two goes to the other service. An ingress controller is SSL or TLS aware, meaning that we can also use this um, to actually secure our communications and make sure that the communication is encrypted between the clients of our application 
any ingress controller. So the moment you actually enter your Kubernetes cluster. It can also do quite nice stuff called name-based virtual hosting. That means that one ingress controller can actually be responsible for tens of different virtual hosts. So that's cool because that means that we can have one ingress controller that can serve up to whatever, 10, 100, depending on size and scale of applications which are basically hosted behind. So essentially think about it as a load balancer or even a proxy, yeah, which um, can do this thing. Now, ingress controllers are pretty complex things. Although the installation may seem very, very easy, um, ingress controllers can be very complex because they need to do a lot of stuff. Um, this is an overview of the ingress controllers I know, like, uh, and don't like. Um, so the list is non-exhaustive. Um, and as I mentioned, there are quite a lot of them. Um, I think one of the most known one is Nginx. Um, but uh, very popular ones are Trifig, Kong, um, Istio. Uh, it has an ingress controller, Glue. Some are based on Nginx, some are based on Envoy, like Glue and Contour are based on Envoy, which is pretty popular. Istio also, by the way. And then we have some commercial versions like AVI Networks, uh, F5, Amazon, Azure, and so on and so forth. So there is a link on the bottom of this slide, which is on the Kubernetes website. Um, even the list there is non-exhaustive. So if you resort to Google, you will find quite some other ones. But the cool thing is that they're all having their specific feature sets. They can all do very fancy stuff, but at the Kubernetes site, we define what we call an ingress resource and automatically it will be implemented on top of these solutions. I will be using the Ingress uh, Nginx example, but even for Nginx, there are three different uh, types. So depending on who is managing. Now, if you install an Ingress controller, um, be careful. Um, it does do quite a lot of stuff. First of all, you should be aware of the fact that an ingress controller is typically installed in a specific namespace. So that means that for the Nginx case, it will install in the ingress Nginx namespace. But I've seen other examples like Trifig, which will, for example, install the ingress controller in Cube system namespace. So think about it, where you want to put it. Um, if you want to manage it or you want to apply RBAC or something else um, on Nginx. Nginx, sorry, on, on the ingress controller. Ingress controllers typically also use config maps um, because the idea of an ingress controller is that you can actually automatically update the configuration and that the and that the ingress controller will adapt it. So if something is put in the etcd database of kubernetes the nginx controller will see it configure the ingress controller um, accordingly quite often there are also a bunch of secrets uh, assigned to it because there might be some passwords there might be service accounts whatever that the ingress controller needs so from a security point pay attention uh, to this Ingress controllers, depending on which websites uh, you look at, uh, typically can be deployed as a deployment. So you can actually say how many you want, or they can actually be deployed as a daemon set, meaning that every node will have one. Um, that's one or the other option. Um, quite often, you will also make sure that they're only applied in specific nodes uh, to control access to the nodes. And last but not least, ingress controllers will also create services for their own, meaning there will be a service to basically reach load balances. So if you install ingress, it will probably, as I mentioned, create its own ingress namespace. It will create services 
and quite often also a low balance. Um, but as I mentioned, this is really related to the type of cloud you're using. So in the example, I will show you that for Nginx, you can download a manifest for DigitalOcean, for Amazon, and so on and so forth. So once we get all these things up and running, we basically have, let's say, it, a very simplistic, a reverse proxy slash load balancer that we can reach externally on port 80 or port 443. Okay, now let's, let's say the infrastructure part of it. The cool thing happens when we actually define what we call an ingress resource. An ingress resource uh, will actually tell Kubernetes to go and update the config map or the ingress controller to make sure that the specifications are added. So in this case, please note that the rule here will say that this ingress controller, when it sees something coming in for app one dockersec.me, which is some domain name I just own and play with. So that means that if we see in this case specifically an HTTP request with a host header, which is app one.dockersec.me, it will actually forward this request to the my nginx cluster ip service now there's a subtle difference that i have to point out and i was caught with it multiple times in the past is that it might assume that the ingress is forwarding it to the service ip address which is not true the ingress will basically check out the my nginx cluster ip service it has a list of endpoints which are the pods it will take that list and configure the ingress in the, our case the nginx one to actually do real load balancing to pot one pot two and pot three so it's not going through the service if you would create an nginx or any other type of proxy and you would mention this name, it will probably go like this. But in this case, I double checked it. It's hard to see inside of Nginx, but it's actually updating the upstream service to make sure there is a real load balancing going up. There are a few different types of ingresses or use cases. Um, it could be a single service ingress, you just app one goes to service one. Uh, we could use name-based virtual hosting that means that we could have different specifications for a host so we could have app one docker segment uh, me app two dot docker dot me all specified in the same specification and based on the name the ingress would basically forward us to the right um, backend it can also do what is called fan out based on the path like slash foo will go to service one and for example slash bar will go to service two that's why i pointed out it's layer seven uh aware meaning it can act based on the host name as well on the url or the uri uh inside of the uh http request this is a small example where we add an annotation. So that means that inside of this ingress, we'll actually use some specific ingress features, which probably are not available or used differently in other types of ingress controllers. Of course, one of the cool things is also uh, TLS. So if you want to use TLS, it might seem very complicated at first sight, but once you get a hang of it, it's, it's pretty easy uh, to use. Um, so it's essentially the same thing I just explained, but we add a specification block of type TLS inside of the ingress resource. Um, 
you see there is a host one. The name that you specified there is basically what is used for server name indication. Server name indication is a concept in TLS that allows you to specify the name or the host name or the common name, technically correct, of the certificate you want to use to authenticate the server. Because just think about, we expose the ingress on port 443. If we have different host names, they will all need a specific certificate or use a wildcard certificate for that. Um, but we need to be able to identify that. So this is a pretty fairly easy way to configure SNI inside of ingress. Now, importantly, is that our ingress also needs to have access to the certificates. Certificates in Kubernetes should be uh, stored inside of a secret. And that secret is typically mounted inside of a pod. So to create a secret, um, you can actually copy paste this. Um, please note that in most cases for ingress, the certificate name here, the data tls.cert, tls.key needs to be tls.cert and tls.key. Um, that's how Nginx picks up on this um, name of the key file and the search name. So that's the only thing uh, I figured out. I only tested this for, for Nginx, but it needs to be TLS cert and TLS key as in the example. So once you apply this, we'll actually go and configure the Nginx mount a secret inside of the Nginx controller, and we will have access to the very well OK certificates um, so that we don't get any TLS warnings. Um, if you Google around a little bit, there are integrations that do this automatically for you, and you can fairly easily use, for example, Let's Encrypt to do this. Um, all of you. If I have the time, I will make an example. But if you Google, um, you will find a lot of examples that uh, explain on how to do it. Now, at Calico, we are basically very uh, fond of security and network security policies. So one of the things we should basically take into account is the only thing we have about security at this moment is our TLS, which is already a good start. But if you have, for example, multiple namespaces and ingress and so on and so forth, and you want to control access, um, one of the things that might be very interesting to look at, and we'll cover that in other workshops uh, in the coming months, is to basically apply network security policies. So that, for example, only the ingress can connect to a specific namespace and specific pods. As you might know, security policies inside of Calico may take namespaces into account or pod labels into account. So you could basically create a rule saying that pods inside of ingress with a label, let's say controller equals ingress, can only access for example, pods inside of namespace. Uh, one with pods which are labeled, for example, um, app one. Yeah? So we might make sure that only ingress can connect to these pods. And for example, my namespace cannot connect to my namespace two, for example. Another area of interest is that we might need to make sure that we control access to our ingress controllers um, to make sure that nobody else connects to our ingress controllers except who is allowed. Um, so that's one case. And last but not least, we might consider putting access control in place for our load balances. Um, honestly, the last part, so the access to the load balances, 
might be something you implement by a security group in AWS or an access list in any other type of cloud. So keep in mind, you can do that. Everything is labeled inside of Kubernetes and with network security policies, you can fairly easily create uh, policies um, to implement this scheme I just explained. I think it's time to head to the demo. Um, Philippe, we have one question on the chat about um, distribution of ingress controller pods. Let me know uh, if you want to take that now. Yes, I can quickly take a look. Thank you. Um, where is the chat window? <laughs> Always. Let me know if you want me to read it out. Yeah, read it out, please. <laughs> it saves me from. <laughs> Okay, so how should I distribute ingress controllers? Should they be on dedicated nodes or close to the application itself? Uh, because Kubernetes spawns node port on every node in the cluster. Traffic might enter on the node which doesn't have an ingress port. Um, then um, talking about excess hops and performance. Right now, he has to have at least 10 ingress controller instances um and it's a little bit annoying um probably doing something wrong any advice there Philippe? yes um so what you're seeing um uh, is probably perfectly okay um if you would install it uh as we will do right now so that's the idea uh very often the ingress controller is deployed as a daemon set which will typically um go into the scenario just described. So my advice would, bear, would be there is to basically assign one or two or three nodes, whatever um, the requirement is, which you can label, for example, as um, ingress nodes or nodes that are actually, uh, let's say, internet facing, okay? Um, that's one thing. Based on the services, and the load balancing configs, you could actually say, instead of basically create a service and expose it on all the nodes, only expose it on specific nodes. You can do that with node selectors if, if, if you want to. Or you could also, at the load balancing level, basically say um, load balance to only this on this node. But let's say, if you want to do it in a fully automated way, I think node selectors would be a great way forward to actually, um, uh, to actually, uh, should I say, uh, force the ingress to be on only the nodes you want them to and control the access. Um, on the second part of the question, if I have ingress controls, if you have ingress control on every node, um, it probably means that you might enter via node nine, for example, and that your ingress controller decides to go to pot one, which perhaps is on node one. So you would have a lot of uh, hopping around, that's, that's sure. Um, but you have the option, basically, if you use um, services, to actually use cluster first or use some other kind of um, settings to make sure that if an ingress controller needs to connect to a pod, it would connect um, to a local pod, for example. Um, so these are options you can uh, explore for this. But as I said, um, ingress controllers themselves, um, although the definition is an ingress resource, um, it relies on a lot of different possibilities, whether it's a five or Amazon. Um, you will for sure see that if you go on these vendors' uh, websites, that they have like tons of annotations or even custom resources, like for example, traffic, uh, they have they can understand ingress, that's for sure. Um, but they also have uh, traffic specific resources with other options and so on and so forth. Okay, so feel free to reach out, but we're running a little bit uh, behind of time. So let me see 
if we can get this working, this is life. So let's bear the demo gods with us so I can hope you can actually see my screen. So what I did is I set up a Kubernetes uh, cluster on Amazon. It's basically a Kubernetes cluster I created myself. Um, so it's not integrated with Amazon, just the VMs are running on Amazon. If you want to replicate this, we'll share uh, this link. And this is a link to a GitHub uh, repo that actually is using or explaining how to build this cluster. We'll cover that in the coming weeks. I think in two weeks from now, we'll go through this workshop and explain you how to set it up with Calico. So let's get started. So first of all, let's quickly check if we get access to our nodes. Yep, there, okay. Um, so as you can see, we have like uh, three nodes, one master and two uh, workers, pretty cool. Just for the sake of it, let's see if we have namespaces. And as you can probably see, there is nothing specifically configured. So it's a clean cluster. So let's use the examples we just uh, described. So if, let's see where the folder is, let's see this workshop. So we should have uh, the examples here. Um, the content of the examples is also here. So what I'm going to do is, and I forgot to point it out, ingress resources yeah, are bound to a namespace. Yeah? So ingress controllers sit in a namespace, but if you create an ingress resource, yeah, they are applied to a specific uh, namespace. So let's create a namespace here yeah, and let's deploy just a few Nginx websites. Nothing specific. I have no especially uh, interest in Nginx, just a web server that is quickly deployed. And as you can see, we're going to simply expose this service through a cluster IP. I'm going to do the same thing for up to. And now we basically have two applications in two different namespaces. Put the proof in the pudding. So as you can see, I have namespace one and two. And if I get the information about app one, you can actually see I have three pods running. You can see the Calico IP addresses assigned to this um, pods. And you can also see that created the cluster IP. This is actually coming from the service side. -ish. And it's basically, basically capturing all the pods which a label uh, app equals Nginx, okay? If we can do the same thing for app two, you can actually see that we're talking about different bots, you see? And they are actually also distributed across different nodes. So one tool I use quite often is Siege. It can generate a lot of traffic in a short time. It's always fun. So note that I'm running Siege um, DockerSec is my repo, so you might consider it uh, okay. And I'm connected to my Nginx cluster IP. It's running an app one. So the name my Nginx cluster IP is the service name. It's also a DNS entry in the namespace app one. So you can see we generate quite some traffic and just to see whether my app two is up and running, we'll do the same thing. And if everything goes okay, we will see that we can generate traffic. So two namespaces, both with the same application, both will have a service my Nginx cluster IP. But as I mentioned, services are namespace bound, means that in both cases, I'm using different um, IP addresses. So I have my apps up and running. So 
let's create an ingress controller. So up, I have an Nginx controller. Um, so you can see I'm using ingress Nginx um, bare metal. Why is this? Because in a bare metal, I typically don't have external load balances uh, configured. But if you would go for DigitalOcean or you would go for Amazon, you will see that there are providers for Amazon and other uh, type of solutions, Google and so on and so forth. So that will mean that our ingress controller will be exposed uh, automatically. So let's see what happens. You can actually see that there is an ingress Nginx namespace created. And if we're going to take a look at this ingress Nginx, you can actually, or you should actually see that we have an ingress Nginx controller running. Yeah. So that's essentially the Nginx controller that will handle my traffic. Um, the other two ones you see here are actually patches and admission controllers. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, once you install Nginx it, or the Nginx uh, ingress controller in this case, but for any type of ingress controller, um, it will do a lot of things in the background. But for the sake of this demo, we have an ingress controller running one uh, to be exact. So let's take a look at what services were created. And as you can see, we have an Nginx controller here uh, of type node port. So it happened automatically. Um, this is the internal cluster IP. And it's listening on port 80. So the Nginx controller is listening on port 80 and 443. But on every node, we can actually reach port 80 on this TCP port, and we can reach the SSL part on this port. So as I said, these are random ports. These are the ports our external load balances in theory would connect to. Now, to avoid that I have to copy paste every time and remember these names. I put a small export part here. So it typically, or it should grab um, these ports and put it in a web variable or secure web. So if you do this, you don't have to go and look for these numbers all of the time. That's for the sake of it. So let's see and let's check what happens. So. When I use the scroll here command, uh, we'll actually see that we get feedback from Nginx, which is already cool. Uh, a 404 not found because we're actually targeting this Nginx controller. It's not configured with a default backend. So it simply says, oh, I saw a request for slash root and I don't know what this page is about which is uh, probably uh, totally OK. Um, and if we would connect to the uh, secure part of the Nginx controller, we get exactly the same error. But I wanted to point out that you see here that the service certificate returned by the uh, Ingress controller is something by default, Ingress controller fake certificate. So interesting information for hackers if this is a default uh, setting. OK. That being that, we have our ingress uh, controller configured. We can reach it um, from my node. But if you have it exposed through a load balancer, um, you could actually reach it from the outside. So let's create right now an ingress for app one. The file is already on my workshop. So you, this is the content you can see app ingress. The host name will be app dockersig.me and it will target this service. So you can see I'm going to apply this YAML file uh, in a namespace app one. It's created, it created the ingress. Let's see if it worked out fine. And we should see right now 
our API answering that we have an ingress configured with a host name app docusec.me. You see this ingress is only available in namespace app one. So let's see if I repeat honestly um, the trick I just did before. So I will copy paste this. Right now I'm adding a host elif. Yeah. So if I do this, we should actually see that I have an Nginx page, which is basically uh, what app one is returning. Yeah. I never configured app two, so my ingress controller will not know anything about app two, and it will actually respond with 404, which is essentially what I had before. So see if we can solve this. So let's supply this ingress with a host name app two into namespace two. Okay. And see it created it okay so we are right now have an ingress for up to in another namespace so we can actually test this up and it will work out fine and you see that it is working okay as well for up one as for up two now cool thing is Creating this ingress is cool. Where did it end up? So if you want to go and figure this out, we might go and take a look at the pods in our ingress namespace here. So this is our Nginx ingress controller, but it would be a similar concept if you want to use Trifig or something else. So let's do something fishy and cute ctl exec into this controller and don't forget the namespace okay so if i didn't type any mistakes we're right now inside of the nginx controller and after some searching we might find out that if we do a cat in nginx, uh, nginx.conf, yeah, we see a lot of stuff. And if we scroll back again a little bit, we should find the entries that were added automatically by our ingress definition. So as you can see, uh, App Server 2 is quite a lot of information. I don't really encourage you to go in there and change anything. Um, but as you can see, it created the server block on App 2. There is also one for App 1, uh, making it listening on port 80 and 443. And the backend nodes, so the pods to which it load bounces are actually uh, configured by Lua scripting, which is a plugin for Nginx, to basically populate the upstream nodes. But as I said, this is actually something uh, is interesting to look at. But if we're using pure ingress, we don't need to change anything. If you need to change anything inside of this config file, which is in this case Nginx specific, you can typically do this by adding annotations inside of your ingress or in your deployment of the controller. Okay, so just for the fun of it, let's exit here. Um, so you know where you can go and take a look. So I'm back in my uh, Kubernetes cluster. Now I spent- hey, Philippe, Yeah. we just had a quick question saying, yeah. can you show the config file path again? We have a couple more questions guys that we'll take at the end though. Okay, so the the config file is at, uh, so if you go in there, is at slash etc slash nginx slash nginx.conf, okay? Um, but as I said, this is purely for nginx, so there would be a trifig uh, tumble file or some other thing in which 
config data is stored. Yeah? So it's it's really um, product specific. But I was just wanted to show you that this Ingus controller is updated um, automatically when we add an Ingress uh, Kubernetes resource. Okay. So now, um, always a difficult part. Um, what about SSL? Typically it's skipped, but I love SSL and TLS, so I'm not going to skip it. So if we want to play around with SSL, we first of all need a certificate. Um, so RUP, we have a certificate. It's a self-signed certificate. Um, and I said that my server name or my server name indication name is TLS app one. So right now I have a certificate and a key. As you can see, I put it in uh, TLS cert and TLS key, um, as I pointed out. Now, these are just files I just created on the Ubuntu operating system. So there is nothing done inside of Kubernetes. So I need to store these uh, key and certs inside of Kubernetes. So I can do this by basically importing these into a TLS secret. So right now, Kubernetes has a secret. And I say it again, it's created inside a specific namespace. So if you want to make it work for app two, you should put it in app two also. And we're happy, we see that we have a secret and it's basically referencing TLS cert and TLS key. This secret is mounted inside of the Ingress uh, controller so that the Ingress controller has access to these files essentially. So right now we can actually apply our um, ingress for TLS. So you need to add the TLS block here, as you mentioned, it's referring our secret and it's referencing the host name. So already copied these on the operating system. So we're going to apply this and we're going to check as every good citizen, if it is available. And as you can see, we have an ingress for a new host. So if I would go into the config file, you will find the server block also. It's listening on port 80 and 443. Pretty cool. Um, now we want to test this and I could shortcut this and do this all up front. But as I pointed out, selecting TLS, uh, what's the name? TLS app one dockersec.me if I would connect to port 443 and I could not say through my SSL or TLS uh, negotiation that I'm looking for TLS app one, it would basically give me that fake certificate of Kubernetes. So I need to find out a way to basically pass this inside of TLS. And the easiest way to do this is basically um, if you don't have external access, otherwise you just put it inside of uh, your DNS. But if you want to test it on Minikube or something, um, just update um, your host file and insert just something like this. It simply means that it simply means that if somebody connects to TLS app one.docker.me, it will go to local host. That's fine for the demo. Let's save this. Okay. And let's test this. So the curl command you see here is basically specifying a host header. This host header, um, just for clarity, is the HTTP host header. So that's not what's inside of the TLS negotiation. In the TLS negotiation, we will basically find this. So if you do it like this, it will resolve to local host, but and to the secure web, we should basically see that the demo gods are with us. Okay, so we get an Nginx page back, which is the backend. And if we scroll back and everything worked out as expected, that we should see somewhere, uh, where is it? Okay, yeah. So you actually see that 
the certificate has a name, sorry, not the issuer, uh, because it's self-signed, the subject, sorry, so the service certificate, so that the subject is TLS app one, the docker signed on me. Um, if this would be successfully signed or signed by Let's Encrypt or something, you should not get any uh, error message inside of your browsers if you connect to it. If you omit this uh, local host and TLS one, and you put it to local host, so the ingress controller wouldn't know to what to do with local host. Um, it would hopefully return also a page, yeah. But as you will see, it returns the wrong certificate okay so if you play around with this um, be careful with the certificates because it's about user experience and security uh, and if you don't pay attention yeah it might be very easy to enumerate um, these ingress controllers just by looking honestly at this part I hope I could have showed you some basic intro about ingress controllers um, and how to install it. I hope I explained well the part on HTTP as well as the HTTPS part. There's a lot of more stuff we can talk about and you can look into, like for example, automatic certificate <laughs> creation, but that will be for another topic. So if there are a few questions, Jane, feel free to read There them. are. Yeah. So I'll read out the questions. Anyone, if you have questions, please type them into the chat or raise your hand. Um, the first one is from Manny. How does Cube Proxy work along with Ingress and Calico? Um, Cube Proxy um, and Ingress, they really do not have much to do with each other. Yeah. So Kube proxy is typically what's implementing the services. Um, so from Ingress, the only time Kube proxy comes into play is to basically expose the Ingress controllers. Yeah. Um, from the Ingress controller towards the pods, um, it's a direct uh, connection. So, QProxy is basically um, what populates the endpoints inside of uh, the service. Thank you. And, and then we have a. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, and Calico is just the part that is working for the IP address assignment. So. Then we think this is a comment. Ingress does not apply to namespaces. Ingress is cluster wide. Um, the ingress itself, so the ingress controller, up to my understanding, um, is cluster wide because it's basically inside of a namespace and exposed uh, on a node port. Applying an ingress configuration, so this part, yeah is bound to a namespace according uh, to the research I've done, okay? But you're, you're right if you're looking at, let's say, this scenario, this definition here, this part, um, oops, that was not the way here. Um, this part, it's installed in a namespace, but it's accessible from anywhere because of the fact that it's exposed. But between ingress and the namespace, um, so an ingress definition is applied to a specific namespace. Thank you. So we have um, how many ingress, but how many ingress objects NGINX uh, ingress controller can support? I guess that's an NGINX specific question um so from an ingress um so in our case we only had one um 
but you can actually scale the ingress controller to one, two, three, four, as I uh, alluded on uh, during the, the first question. You can install and you can uh, apply different ingress controllers, meaning that you might have an ingress controller, which is, for example, internal ingress. Uh, you might have another external ingress and you might, for example, also install traffic traffic on this solution. In that case, we will have like three ingress controller setups. Um, so there's always a default one. So by specifying an ingress class in your service or sorry, in your ingress definition, um, there is an annotation for it ingress class, you could actually say which ingress controller should implement this um, ingress. So it's, it's possible, although I figured out that in version 1.18 of Kubernetes, uh, things changed slightly and it's not through an annotation, um, but through a resource inside of Kubernetes that you can change it. But I didn't find any examples yet at this point. Thank you. Um, someone is asking, he joined in the middle of the presentation. Can you tell me if you're implementing load balancer and what cloud platform you're using? If, if you want to disclose that, Billy, that's up to you. Um, at this moment, I'm using uh, Amazon EC2 instances on which I installed Ubuntu with um, Kubernetes uh, uh, but with kubeadmin. So it's, let's say, a bare metal install on a VM in Amazon. So it's not integrated with any type of cloud. Um, but this screenshot here um, is a slightly modified one, but it was using uh, DigitalOcean to do it. So if you would do this on DigitalOcean, um, you could fairly easily um, get a load balancer uh, configured. But if you would use uh, AKS or you would use DigitalOcean or Google, uh, as long as you would use a managed cloud or Kubernetes, um, um, the load balancing part would be uh, automatically configured for you. And then you need, for example, ingress clauses to override the default ingress. Thank you. Um, Mohammed asks, how is the support process defined in the case of an external proxy like Citrix, F5, or Abbey? Um, and he's asking about how, how, we, how, we, how we should deal with fights between vendors. I don't know if we can help with that one, Mohammed. Um, so yeah, the, the port forwarding, and basically when you would like to implement, oh, sorry, imagine that you would like to use I'm just taking F5 as an example, yeah, um, um, or AVI network. What typically needs to be done is that you need to install a controller on Kubernetes that watches for service updates of kind load balancer. So if a controller inside of Kubernetes sees that somebody creates a load balancing object, it will actually go and configure the, uh, the F5 or the AVI load balancer, any other type of load balancer for that matter, um, to basically, uh, with the endpoints, in a five case, it would be pools, yeah, or the pool. Now there are, or there might be different ways. If you, for example, Google uh, the AWS application layer load balancer or a similar thing in AKS, uh, the ingress, yeah, it, it all depends. For Calico, for example, um, you might make sure that the pod IP addresses are reachable from outside. So an F5 could reach directly if you have BGP. But in the case you're using an overlay like VXLAN, your pods are typically not reachable. That would mean that the load balancer or the F5 would basically load balance to the north port. But all that information is available in the Cube API in the etcd database. So typically every vendor has a controller that can actually authenticate to the load balancer and automatically configure them. 
Dennis, Dennis asks how NGI Next ingress resources can be made available to use across uh, across different namespaces. The ingress controller itself, yeah, as I said, is reachable. It's it's not because an ingress controller is inside of a namespace uh, that it is not reachable, yeah. Uh, an ingress or a namespace inside of Kubernetes yeah, is a kind of logical isolation. Yeah? Um, but you can reach the ingress controller from anywhere on the network. Yeah? Um, for example, um, if you would look at, uh, I don't know if I can show this quickly, but kubectl. Uh, get uh, pods in namespace, no, leave it in namespace ingress nginx. Out of my head, you see that the ingress controller here yeah, is available on an IP address. Yeah? So this IP address is perfectly reachable out of namespace ingress nginx. But if I would go into, you know, uh, let me see if I can do this. Uh, if I can keep uh, CTLN in IT. See if busy box if it works out. Didn't try this, but let's see in namespace app one, for example. Let's see if it works. Come on. And I would basically curl to this IP address. Yeah, it will have connectivity. I agree with you that if I would connect to the name ingress nginx controller, that it didn't work, but you can do ingress nginx controller dot. Uh, I see the point. Uh, I see. I don't know why it's not working, but. Um, if you would connect um, from, let's if you would connect to this IP address, it would be reachable from all the namespaces. Yeah. Um, if you would like have, to do on the name. Sorry, the I was just gonna say we have uh, two more questions, but yeah, you, do you wanna put that's yeah. okay. Do you wanna put, put up those last two slides so people can see how to get in touch with us? Okay. So if it's not clear the answer, feel free to reach out on Twitter or email and we'll discuss this. Um, so I went back here, sorry for this. Um, so the upcoming events. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we will have one on uh, the following topics. The one uh, Kubernetes network policy introduction. I I think it's hosted in uh, also in EMEA, so what do you mean? And as you know, Calico Enterprise, which is basically a solution of Tigera based totally on Calico, where the UI, staging, auto creation, and so on and so forth, uh, logging, feel free to go to tagira.io slash trial, and you can get an access uh, to the system and to test it. So Calico Enterprise, as I mentioned, um, there are events also that will be hosted that purely focus on this, but feel free to check it out. It's a great tool, lots of UI logging and additional features. Uh, and Jane and myself can help you uh, with that um, if you reach out to us. We'll copy the questions. Um, feel free to reach out to us. If not, everything got answered. Because we're already ready over time. Um, yeah. And I thank you for your attention, the questions, the interaction. Um, 
many thanks for this and hope to see you soon somewhere on another type of event.